And what I'm going to assume is that you don't know anything about the Celtic Church. That that will be my assumption. So, you know, I, I know that that will that's not true, but just so that we've got somewhere to start. And um, if I could have the next slide, please. So I wrote this book. Um, I'm I'm involved with the retreat centre that uh, Clive and Christine lead. Uh, we call them wardens, and we have cells, and it's um, <laughs> um, so. And, and I wrote the book um, it, during lockdown. Um, is, is it all right if we have the lights on? I I, I I heard that if you turn the lights off for for slides, that people go to sleep. So, um, um, so. I wrote this. I wrote this book. I, I've never had ambitions to be an author. I didn't particularly want to write a book on this, but we were we were chatting with some with, with Clive and Christina and somebody else who runs our prayer network, and we said we could do with what resources do we need? And so, so one of them was we need something to help people understand the basis of of, of what we're doing there. So I wrote this book, and. Um, my wife painted the cover picture uh, in an hour. So I think that must have been God, actually. But, and I called it Cultivating God's Presence because, you know, we can't, there's no technique that will make God be present. <laughs> but, you know, cultivation comes from gardening, doesn't it? So if, if, if we can get the conditions right, we're more likely to grow things. And so the idea behind the book is what can we learn from the Celtic Church about how they sought to establish the presence of God. And because like all monastic movements, their, their prime aim is, is to uh, know the presence of God. It could have been called carrying God's presence because that's the other part of the rhythm of withdrawal and, and engagement, isn't it? That we withdraw to know God's presence, and then we we carry God's presence with us. And so, uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, so, um, when we talk about Celtic, um, what we mean is essentially the the church which developed in the fifth century, at the beginning of the Dark Ages, so called, when the Romans were the Romans withdrew from what was then sort of England and Wales, and the Anglo-Saxons came over, and the society got chaotic, and a lot of the English Christians, the, the monks in particular, went over the seas to Ireland, because that, that was, you know, truly wild and place for evangelism, but you could also get away from the Anglo-Saxons, which, you know, many people want to do these days, but um, so... They, they, they went across and they, they took with them a very few books, but including the Bible in Latin and the writings of John Cassian, who had spent time with the Desert Fathers, and he, and he wrote down the sayings of the Desert Fathers. And so this, this church developed it in, a, in isolation in, in Ireland, and uh, from there... They, they sent out missionaries um, back to uh, England, to Cornwall down here, uh, where my, some of my family comes from Cornwall, Wales, Scotland, and the tip of uh, the coast of France. And um, one author has said that they swarmed across Europe like bees. Hopefully not stinging anybody, but that, that, so they were a missional. They were a contemplative but missional movement. So I've got personal links. My grandfather uh, on one side was Welsh, and my grandmother was Cornish. So uh, I'm a Celt. My my wife is half Irish. I'm not quite sure which half, but um, <laughs> she, so. Um, I'm a trustee at Father Brennan in Wales, 
and I love holidaying in Scotland, so I've got a lot of, uh, of interest. But there's a big interest in the Celtic Church in the UK because the UK is really a bit of a spiritual desert. And so we were looking back for uh, how, how did these people survive? I mean, they went and evangelized people wh where Christianity was, was unknown. And how, how did they do that? And so um, I went to Father Brennan in the 1990s before, it's quite famous now, but in those days you could be there virtually on your own. And my wife, Norma, uh, saw a book called Colonies of Heaven, which is a very good book um, on the Celtic Church by Ian Bradley. It's non-romanticized because, because a lot of books on the Celtic Church are very romanticized. And, and this was a, a, a good historical book. And she said to me, you've got to read this book. Uh, I, I think you should look at this. And I said to her, I don't want to. Um, I, I, know, I know so much already that I can't really work out. I don't want to read anything else. Thank you very much. Uh, but she, she insisted. And, and I gave in. And that began a bit of a, a journey for me. If I can have the next slide, please. Hi. And so, um, it, essentially, this is true, true of a lot of monastic movements, very true of the Celtic Church. What, what was evident was that they had this rhythm built into their lives of withdrawal and engagement. So they would withdraw to become more aware of the presence of God, and they would then go back to engage with the, the people around them. And this, um, so this was a contemplative and missional model where they cultivated the presence of God and they carried the presence of God. And th this, this, um, this helped me a lot to see this model. Um, so I, I'm in a fairly rural area, um, as Tom said, involved in home-based church, uh, which, which is less busy as a model of church if you're in church leadership the church virtually runs itself because we've got a lot of people who do lots of different things and I have a very unusual life in that I have long periods where I'm spending a lot of time in in my study reading and thinking and uh, praying and then and then I have other periods where I have a much more intensive engagement like the, the, this 10 days now here and it sort of like worried me because I thought this is just a weird pattern for Christian ministry. But then, then I saw it in the Celtic saints and it made me think, I'm not so weird after all, which probably isn't true. And I've got to speed up because I'm still on the first page. But so they, so, so they would, they would, if you read about some of the very prominent Christian uh, leaders in the Celtic church, often they started off as hermits. So they had long periods on the road. Then they would be dragged into some leadership responsibility because people would see that, see how wonderful they were. Um, I mean, Martin of Tours was a very interesting example of this. Um, I mean, it says that he was very sort of unkempt and you know li living as a hermit, and they the people of Tours dragged him and said, "We want you to become your bishop." So he said, "Okay," and lived in a hut next to the next to, to the, cathedral, the, the, the church in Tours, lived in a hut, and established a training center that evangelized southern Europe. You know, you think, this is very weird, isn't it? <laughs> so, and then when, when they got into positions of responsibility, they might have somewhere like a, a little island they'd go off to and live there for three months to seek God's presence, and then they, they'd come back. So th there's this idea of rhythm that um, David was talking about yesterday. And um, I like to think of it in this little phrase. That, so they had a rhythm of work, worship, rest, and recreation. I won't go into that, but rest and recreation are different, aren't they? So recreation recreates you. And so they, they did this in order to... Um, 
to live lives that would be effective in the long term. You know, how, how can we be in it for the long haul? And that they, they systematize their life into what they call the rule of life. And we don't like the term rule of life because it sounds grim, but it, it was actually more like um, a pattern of life. So, that, so they asked, what, what is the pattern of life that we need to adopt? And that's very good for people like me who were um, converted into the activist evangelical church where you, know, you, ha you have your quiet time and, <laughs> and, and that's it. You know, you're, that, that's what you get. So, um, you, you know, I'm not a gardener, but if, if you're growing beans, you, you construct a trellis, don't you? So the idea is not the trellis. The trellis isn't the thing. You're not doing the rule of life in order to prove that you're good to God or whatever, but the trellis supports your growth. And that's what the rule of life does. And so, um, um, it's interesting reading some of these rules. The most famous rule is the rule of Benedict. And because he had these very, well, Benedictine communities are very structured. So he had 73 chapters, including how in a community you should always listen to the youngest person. That's very good, isn't it, I think. And the one that I particularly like is how much beer should a monk have in a week. <laughs> what was the answer? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Benedict. So, the Bened gave rise to the Benedictine order, which was essentially the structure of... Sorry, I'm just rambling, really. But that, it created the structure of Western civilization, the Benedictine monasteries they probably invented they probably were the early industrial revolution because they had to decide you know we're praying eight times a day but we're also farming and running hospitality things how do we do that so they invented machinery interesting isn't it so um so what what, what i've done with, with our local church is i've I thought, well, I can't use the term rule of life because that will scare people. So I've just said, we have these values and everything we do needs to relate to these values. And so our, our values spell H. You can have the next uh, slide, please. So, so um, oh, that's it. So they spell the word have, hospitality, availability, vulnerability, expression. So... Our hospitality is the heart of the gospel, isn't it? I'm not thinking about cooking meals, but it's like that Zach Williams song, isn't it? Come to the table. That, that's the basis. How do, we, how do we make spaces for people? Um, how do we become generous people? How do we listen to people? How do we build hospitality into all that we do beyond having coffee and donuts before our meetings, you know, uh, which is good. But how do we create that space? Availability is about availability to God. So hospitality is about making ourselves open and inviting to other people. Availability it, are those practices that help us to develop prayer, openness to the spirit, uh, scripture reading. Vulnerability is, is interesting because Essentially, vulnerability, you could say humility. Um, so for the first thousand years of the church, the, the cardinal sin, the primary sin, was regarded as being pride. And, and all monastic practice, I mean, obviously I've said it's geared to the presence of God, but all monastic practice was also geared towards embracing humility which isn't about being groveling or, or miserable, um, but it's really about admitting our humanity, humus, humility, earth, dirt, humus, humility, humanity. It's all the same root. And then um, e expression is how we give um, expression to our faith uh, 
in terms of our time, our money, our resources. So we just have this very simple framework and we just ask people if they want to journey with us. These are our values. Can you sign up to this type of thing? And uh, you can link talks in with the values. And um, my wife, Norma, is her name means rule or pattern, which is interesting, isn't it? So, um, so, so this helps us in decision making, big decisions, small decisions. How, 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 if I do this, how will it affect my availability to God? Will it help me be more hospitable? Uh, will it help me be more, more vulnerable, and, and open and and, and um, uh, and honest? And so, so you know, part of this is developing a rhythm of life, and uh, I think that the nest is an incredible resource for that, isn't it? I mean, I don't know what else you have here, but it, it's somewhere you can come and wander around and have a half day retreat or a day retreat or, or longer. So that's the first thing I wanted to say about the Celtic church was that um, one of the key, key features was that they developed a rhythm that sustained them. I, I won't go into it now, but reading of the Psalms every day. They didn't read them, they memorized them and some of them would recite 150 psalms in a day. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so I, I read one every day. I think that's pretty good. <clears throat> so the second thing, um, second characteristic, is this idea of a thin place. And um, so for, for the Celts, and this was because of their pre-Christian background, they didn't see heaven up there and earth down here. They saw heaven as being a realm that's coexistent with, with, with our realm, but often veiled. So you can see the, the examples in Scripture when the veil is drawn back, you know, Jacob at Bethel and uh, Elisha's servant when he sees the horses and chariots on the hillside. And... Um, so uh, I think I started reading about and became quite aware of this thing of a thin place and God's presence at Father Brennan. If I can have the next slide, please. So, so that's, this is Father Brennan. I took this picture, was it last year or the year before, from Clive and Christina's living room window. This is, is amazing, the um, rainbow, isn't it? Over the laundry, <laughs> so, and, um, so this is the accommodation for guests. This is the offices and Clive and Christina's uh, home on on your right, and um, so and it has been a place of, of God's presence. I I was there uh, some years ago. I took a group of mainly Baptist pastors. On, on a retreat there. Um, many of them were totally addicted to their, it was blackberries in those days. They were, they were so addicted to their blackberries. Anyway, I sent them off on a retreat exercise where they had to be silent for an hour and a half and not look at their blackberries, which was a huge challenge for some of them. And um, I went into the chapel and I sat down and the presence of God was so heavy that I had to get out because I thought if I sit there, I'm not going to be able to I'm not going to be able to lead the rest of the retreat because it was just too overwhelming. And, you know, th th this happens in places and times, particularly where there's, there's a rhythm of prayer. So um, <clears throat> just go back uh, 1,400 years, there was a, a, an Irish monk called St. Brinnock. And St. Brinnock came from Ireland, landed on the coast of Wales, he resisted the advances of a noble woman, <clears throat> and so the locals beat him up. So he had to go somewhere else. So he went to this valley called the Guam Valley, and uh, people couldn't live in the valley because of the howling of demons. So he went up onto a hill and started praying, 
and people saw visions of angels coming down on the hill. And uh, so th they called the hill Carningli, which means the hill of angels. Fast forward um, to the 1980s, there's a couple called Peter and Philida Mould. Philida, Philida died uh, earlier this year. We, we went to Philida's funeral, heard some amazing stories. But Peter was a British diplomat. They returned to the UK, and Philida had had a vision of a of a place and they couldn't they couldn't find it and she more or less put it to one side and they were on holiday in Wales and they saw somewhere in a realtor's window and they said that's the place and they bought it and they made um, converted to a retreat center and um, and it's under Carningley and, and I think it's the legacy of St. Brunac that people have tapped into. And uh, we had all sorts of interesting things there. Early on, there was a, a lady from a church who, where they didn't believe in healing, she came with a church group. She had a, a, a mal-united fracture, a fracture of, of an arm, forearm, that wouldn't knit together it, in a cast, plaster cast. Did I say that correctly? Plaster cast? Is that the way? I don't know how you say it. <laughs> My wife even tells me I say it wrong. But So it was in a, a plaster cast, and um, suddenly the, her arm started healing, and they had to take the cast off, and her, and her arm had spontaneously healed. I, and it's not a healing center. Can you tell the story of the lady recently? So this is before, just before we arrived at... Well, Brendan, so it's uh, just over two years ago. Uh, one of um, one of Rich's uh, fellow board members was um, in reception receiving people. This lady arrives, and uh, she it becomes evident that she's not a Christian believer, uh, but she must have had a friend, uh, a Christian friend, who who said, "You need to go to Felder Brennan. Uh, because and it was because she had one leg that was almost um, uh, unusable and so very restricted movement and she said I've come here to get healed and um, and Peter who received her very wisely he said and I, I see there's a cross just up up there so we we have similarly there's a cross on the on the end of a promontory he said uh, he said, why don't you just take yourself, there's a bench out there, go and sit there and see what God will do. Uh, he resisted kind of the, it, the, in, the desire for, for her to be prayed for. He said, just go and sit. And so she, she, uh, she went along the, the path reluctantly. She said, I, I'm not sure I'm going to make it. He said, you'll be fine. And she spent a couple of hours there just by the cross. When she came back, she'd had a revelation of Christ. She'd become uh, a, a believer, and her leg was completely healed. And it was just her in God's presence. So, um, you, you know, we tell these stories, and, and I'm sure others could tell similar stories here. N not to say that the place is special because of anything anybody's done. Apart perhaps from St. Brunet. And, um, you know, things like the rhythm of prayer help. But, um, so, I mean, it seemed, I, I had to do like a, a rethink because from my background, nowhere was more, no, God wasn't present, more present anywhere than anywhere else. So, and that's sort of true. But you know, we've discovered that there are places where it's much easier to pray. We have a a, a room in our garden, a garden room, and we've dedicated it really to prayer. And people go in there, and and I go in there, and it's easier to pray there than it is in my office. And it's weird, and you think, how does this happen? And it's because People have sought God in that place. Um, I've got five minutes. I just just want to 
talk about another feature of Celtic monasticism that I think is quite helpful, and, and that is about the structure of Irish monasticism. So you probably know St. Patrick uh, lived in Britannia, as it then was. He was taken as a slave to Ireland. He uh, had a vision of a boat that would take him back after many years. He returned to England. He eventually uh, trained as a priest. He went back to, um, to Ireland. And if you read some of the accounts, you see this account of like confrontation, but it was, he was probably more of a diplomat than a confronter, in, in fact. There are 150 tribes in Ireland. You imagine that, going somewhere, there's 150 kings, and they have sort of power over what happens to you. And you're, you're going to try and persuade them to give their sons and their daughters to become monks and priests. And, but 40 of the tribes were converted in the time of, of St. Patrick. I mean, just imagine that. There were some, there were some conflicts with the Druids, and um, he developed, or, or the Celtic church developed missionary methods, which I imagine would be in keeping with, with Tim's book in that they tried to take over the culture, what was existing in the culture. If there was a sacred well, they, they would try and create a place of Christian worship there, not, not just sort of discard it. And they established a system of bishops, but that sort of more or less petered out in a hundred years. There were still bishops and um, uh, priests. It was very easy to become a bishop because every tribe, Christian tribe wanted one, so you could be, be the bishop of 300 people or something. Um, but, but what happened was that the monasteries, and this is unique, I think, in Christian history, the monasteries were the main center of things. And, and that from the monasteries, they might plant churches or whatever. And th this is the thing that I picked up from it, was the diversity of the ministry of those different monasteries. Um, there wasn't this idea that that to be the real thing, it was one size fits all. It was more like, well, what's God calling you to do? Uh, the one I love particularly is St. Finian, who uh, formed a monastery that educated people. I think at one time he had over 3,000 people there. And if you read of the, 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 some of the major Celtic saints, like St. Columba, like um, Brendan the Navigator, who, you know, they think sailed this way um, uh, in the Dark Ages. They were trained at St. Finian's Monastery. Then you have other monasteries like Linda's Farm, Holy Island, where they produced these beautiful illuminated manuscripts. So they, they were centers of art, creativity. That, that was their, their calling. I mean, many of them had what they would call a hospitium, which is where they received um, strangers, from, and from which we get the word hospitality, and from which we get the word hospital. Amazing, isn't it? It's, so there, there is this, there's this diversity. Uh, can I have the next uh, slide, please? So, uh, so that that's um, part of the Lindisfarne Gospels, I suppose, many of you seen that, but they did this beautiful art to illustrate uh, the scriptures. And I wonder whether that's a good model for churches today. You know, different structures, different mission, different gifts, different call. So I've just really tried to deal with some of those, uh, some of the features of Irish monasticism. One thing I've really left out of it is their idea of pilgrimage, which was to do with taking God with them, not going somewhere to find God. And they were truly missional, truly r risky. Um, if I could just have the, the last um, slide. So that's what I've tried to look at. The rhythm that they established, that they had this idea of, of a thin place, you know, cr creating cultivating God's presence, not just in people, but in, in places, in, in, in our 
homes, in our streets, in our churches, in our retreat centers, you know, if people can walk in and experience the presence of God, that's great, isn't it? The job, the job's half done. So, um, and, the, and then the variety of, um, of, of structures of ministry of calling. So it is truly a privilege to be here with you, and I pray that God might continue to bless you. And I just want to finish with a blessing that's based on the Celtic approach to um, spirituality. Um, May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Mm -hmm.